Okay, we are going to start the event and first of all I would like to say and wish you a very nice evening. I'm very happy that so many of you came and that you're interested in this very timely topic in my opinion. Uh, I also want to thank the Avant Verlag who was supporting us in this and I, of course I would like to um, welcome our special guests from Madrid and the other one came from Rome today, Carlos Botorna and Guillermo Abril. Um, welcome to the Institute for Peace. Please take the mirror already. I'm going to make a short introduction, um, just so you know like um, whom Carlos and Guillermo are. Um, this is Carlos Botorna. And he's a Spanish documentarian photographer, and his work is based on his interests mostly in economic, social, and political topics. He's publishing regularly uh, on the El País Semanal, and also published, I think, five or six books in total. And uh, he has a very, very long list of awards and nominations, and most importantly, uh, he has been awarded with the World Press Photo Award in 2003 and 2015. The one in 2015, I think, together also with Guillermo yeah, Albi. Right. And so, thank you very much for coming. I'm very happy that you came, and I look forward to what you are going to tell us a little bit later. Welcome. Um, Guillermo Albi is a Spanish uh, journalist, and he also published manifold articles and documentaries and portraits, also for the El País Semanal. And he also won, a, as I already said earlier, press, a World Press Photo Award for his documentary short film, At the Gates of Europe. Welcome to Vienna. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So maybe very, uh, very shortly about the procedure, um, I'm going to say just maybe three more words and then I will hand over to our guests and they are going to tell you about their project, how they did their, what they did, what was behind uh, their ideas and how they came up in the end with this very fascinating and uh, wonderful and as I already said very timely topic dealing with the borders of the European Union and not only with the borders of the European Union but even more with the cracks of the European Union which are uh, very easily or not so easily can be seen at the borders. Um, in the beginning of your book you mentioned the European Union as a, as a project, as a, as a project also for peace, especially after the two brutal war, the wars, the first and the second world war. And after all these horrors and atrocities, um, the countries came together and said, you know, if we actually want to have a sustainable peace at some point, what we need to do is we have to work closer together and we have to come together. And this is, the, this is the, the historical background maybe of the movement of the European Union. Then several, after several treaties, then in Maastricht, the European Union came actually into force. And uh, it's, since then, I would say it's a symbol, it's a symbol for peace, freedom, and to a large extent also of um, frontiers, of open frontiers and open borders. And these achievements are actually also um, kind of why so many people would like to come to Europe, because it is peace since uh, now, 70 years, and um, this is what many, many people who are fleeing their countries are not really able to get. Um, in 2013, there was a happening, there was a vessel, a vessel in the Mediterranean um, Sea um, drowned and, drowned and uh, nearly 400 people died there. And this was maybe a little bit a wake up for many Europeans to see, oh look what is going on there in the Mediterranean Sea. People are actually dying there. And then, as I am informed, your editor came and said, you know what, um, go there, go to the frontiers, go to the European borders and just take colors, take photographs, make, make a story, just tell us what is going on there. And this is in the end what, what came out of it. And I'm, very happy that you're going to show us a little bit more of it, and now I hand over the floor to you. Thank you. All right, thank you for this. <laughs> All right. Well, good evening. I'm going to stand up for a moment because I would like to, uh, you know, this is the first time I'm in Vienna, can you imagine? Uh, first time in, in Austria, actually. But I have a relationship with this city. Um, and it is related to what we're talking about today. Today we're talking about Europe, European Union, and what it means to travel 
from one country to another or not being able to one country to another. I was born in Budapest in 71. Um, my parents were living there, although they are Spanish. My father was a diplomat and that time there were no diplomatic relationship between Spain and Hungary. In fact, the embassy was about to be opened. That was my father's job, together with other diplomats who were opening this embassy after decades of uh, uh, unexistence of relation, diplomatic relationship between, between these two countries. I was born there, and the priest that baptized me refused to use the Spanish word for Carlos, and he would like to baptize me Karoy. My parents refused to be to use the word the Hungarian word Karoy to baptize me. So they ended up with an agreement. They so I was baptized as Karolus in Latin. <laughs> so that is already a kind of you know going really back in the European roots. But this is now the thing that ties me to Vienna. The thing is that I had to be registered somewhere. And because the uh, register in Budapest was not uh, recognized by Spain at the time, so I was registered here in Vienna. So my first living document in my life was here in Vienna. It's somewhere in a, in a piece of paper in your uh, legal register. So Carolus Spotorno was registered in Vienna here in 71. And, but that is, this is how difficult it was before when uh, you know, when countries don't recognize each other, that's the uh, ultimate lack of uh, mobility. Things have evolved a lot. Of course, I, I see many young faces, you can't even think about it. Other people are less young and you can remember that. Uh, so, well, we're gonna talk about this. Um, allow me to show you a short video. Uh, it's about two minutes. It will very quickly put us in the uh, in the context of uh, what is this book about. So it, maybe we need to turn down the lights. Not working. Oh yeah, it needs a little bit of time until the okay. email is started. All right. There you go. Light needs to hit so that it's our head. Is it okay like this? I pro I don't really see it. Do you see? Do you see? Maybe. Now, can you turn the left? All right. There you go.
So this is where we start. This is um, in these years since 2013 to the, or early 2014, Europe has evolved a lot. Many things happen, and we 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 want to talk about this project and we what he, we, we what we have been doing, and we will take you with us. Um, through the book, through the making of the book, because this will help us tell, uh, talk about Europe as well. You know, our trip from the beginning of the project to today, we are here in Vienna talking about this. Our trip is, is, is a three years long trip, more or less, and, and has gone together with the evolving of the European Union. Many things very transcendent things hap ha happened between 2014 and 2016. And while things were evolving, we evolved too and we changed our minds in different aspects. So I would like to tell you how everything started. So maybe uh, before I do this, I would like to show you a few, well, more than a few, but some pages of this book. So when we talk, you know what we're talking about. What, what is this? I don't know how many of you have already seen the book, but if not, with this, uh, uh, with this presentation of pages, you can have an idea of what is this about. It's a kind of a graphic novel made of photographs showing uh, the external borders of the European Union. And so this is how it looks like. And very quickly, I will start to talk about it. Maybe Guillermo will start explaining, you know, we, we need to <laughs> share this presentation. <clears throat> and, and because everything started from his side, I think it's now for him time to talk, please. Um, yeah, well, um, in fact, it didn't start on my side, it was uh, my boss who uh, approached, as you already said, to me, after maybe you all remember that the drowning uh, in, in the coast of Lampedusa, where almost 400 people died, it was like a, a kind of alert. Um, but the, the thing about it is that the, my, my boss is, had this idea of going to three or four hotspots on the border. And that was uh, to be very, I mean, it was supposed to be very strict. Go to the border, to where you can see the fences, um, where you can see the policemen, uh, or the refugees, or the migrants over there. Um, so we chose those uh, hotspots, but it was only the southern border of Europe, which was uh, at that moment the important thing. So those are the, those places. We visited Melilla, which uh, maybe you know, maybe you don't. It's a very strange place. It's uh, a piece of Europe in Africa. It belongs to Spain, um, and it's a uh, really small place. It's um, 12 uh, square kilometers, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12 square kilometers, and uh, surrounded by a fence, so people don't get into Melilla, because if they get into Melilla, it means they get into European Union. Uh, so that was our first visit. Then we went all the way to Greece and Bulgaria, uh, because they followed the example uh, in Greece uh, of Spain, so they, built a, they were building at the, at the time a border. Uh, why were they building a, a border? Because they, they were beginning to have lots of uh, Syrian people. There was a war over there. We didn't talk uh, much about that because it was, first it was like a, an Arab revolt, uh, uh, the spring revolt that we, that, we had, uh, that we had. But then it became a civil war and it wasn't yet the international uh, war that we had over there uh, some years later. And so they built this fence, copying the Spanish fence, and uh, they blocked the, the transit of people, so they started to go to Bulgaria. Um, so we visited Bulgaria too, and they were astonished uh, because they were uh, migrants from, I mean, Bulgaria is the poorest country in the European Union, and suddenly, suddenly they had these uh, thousands of people going to that country. So they began to build a wall too. Um, and of course, uh, our last visit was uh, Sicily, Lampedusa, and uh, what I believe was a, a, a the most shocking moment of our trip at, at that time, um, it was a rescue in the middle of the Mediterranean uh, by the Operation Mare Nostrum. I don't know if you remember that, but when the, this 
crisis uh, began, um, Italy uh, launched a military operation. That was the first time a military operation was uh, launched uh, to save migrants uh, from the sea. They were very successful in rescuing people. Um, they rescued in one year uh, 120,000 people. Uh, and that was really the beginning of a huge uh, migration crisis, a refugee crisis that we were going to see later on. But that was our first trip, the southern border. And, and I would like to you know, uh, go a little back in time and, and remember that in 2014, today it's very strange to, to talk about this or even to remember, but in 2014, the issue of these uh, migrants entering European countries was not perceived as a European topic. It was perceived as a local thing. You know, people in Denmark wouldn't even think about what's going on, who's entering Melilla or Greece or whatever. That's, that's their problem down deep in the south. Not even in Germany uh, they were uh, worried about this. Of course, there were some journalists and some specialized people or people who were already into the topic that were aware of that. But the general audience had no idea and they were not very much involved in this thing. And so this is one of the biggest transformations we have seen during this time. The transformation from a local thing to a full European issue, and I would even say the number one European issue for the coming years. Uh, that was a transformation that we witnessed and we followed, and it's viewable in the book how things evolve easily. So in the beginning, we did this uh, trip uh, in a very kind of traditional way. For you to know, this is Melilla. This is the, 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 how the fence looks uh, like. No, it's um, an incredible barrier yeah. uh, that we invented, the Spanish. So in, so in the city. left it's uh, Spain, in the right side it's Morocco. So when we talk about the Trump wall, we should remember we are the wall experts. We have big walls. Yeah, it's six meters high. They've got another fence three meters high and another six meter high fence. Yeah. And they were supposed to. Well, I mean, no, I was, yeah, uh, sorry, I didn't want to interrupt <laughs> you. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> no, no, was, no the, thing, the thing about it is, we talked to the, the, the police guys over there. They were very proud of their fence and they told us they even um, uh, they, they made some, some uh, with, with the samples of, of the fence, they tried them with um, alpinists and athletes and they were impossible to climb. But then, when the migrants came, they were able to cross them in two minutes' time. So, <laughs> wait, wait, wait. when they tested the fence, they didn't they, they didn't put in the equation the motivation of people. Yeah. So, <laughs> when you are motivated, you jump faster. <laughs> yeah, but the thing is, uh, the, I mean, it was an, it was a, even a European issue because, and that was the thing that got us over there because at that time it was in Europe. They talk about this this fence. People got really hurt with them. Uh, they climbed it and they, they cut themselves really deep. It was horrible. Even people died inside and it's a horrible place. So, yeah, we went, uh, you know, we went with the, in this uh, Italian Navy ship. We witnessed this rescue operation that you will see in more details in the book. Or this is the image of the cover. And this is Harmanli, this uh, Bulgarian refugee camp where... Um, Syrians and mostly Africans from sub-Saharan countries were living. Uh, even inside the refugee camp there were differences. There were like uh, neighborhoods. The Syrian neighborhood looked like this and the African neighborhood was a lot worse. And there were even uh, you know, diseases that... What, anyway. So this was... Um, how it was published in the beginning. So it, it, it became, of course, a cover story because it was big news in Southern Europe at that point. Europe, Southern Border, that was a big title. And that was, uh, that was still, still becoming something bigger that involved more countries. So this is how it was published with multimedia and videos and so on. Well, the, the multimedia aspect is in, interesting to, to, I don't know if you, there are any journalists in the room, uh, but they, they like this anecdote because, um, okay, they were very ambitious in the beginning, my editors in, in El Pais, 
Uh, so we're going to go for this huge story. We want you to travel with Carlos to these many places, blah, blah. And then when the, we, we made two trips, and for the third trip, they asked me, is it necessary for Carlos to go with you for this third trip? And I said, okay, <laughs> talk to Carlos. Carlos, there's something going on in the, in the, in the newsroom, blah, blah, blah. And uh, so the, um, uh, we, we had this plan. We said, uh, okay, um, there's something missing in the story. Our third trip was uh, going to Sicily. It was the Mediterranean Sea. So I said, okay, we need Mediterranean Sea in the story. We cannot publish a story without Mediterranean. That was not good enough. The second thing was, oh, we can make a video for a good online thing. And this was the good online thing, um, online multimedia uh, with hundreds of pictures and a short video that, uh, I don't know if you have it over there, but uh, yeah, this one. I finally got the World Press Photo Award, uh, and I believe it was Time Magazine, the first award. Uh, the second was New York Times, and we were the third, so we were very, really proud, I mean, uh, for this to happen. But the point, I mean, the reason we are talking about how it was first published, and then it, will, it became the book, it has become, that's because in this book we not we talk about Europe, but we also talk about media and about journalism and how journalism is made. And and is it you know journalism as everything is in big crisis? It's very difficult today to cover big stories because newspapers they are not paying for that anymore. Uh, audience is not very interested, or at least this is what uh, 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 media thinks. In fact, when we were assigned this story, we were also told, enjoy this one because this is going to be the last one you do a, a story like this. That was after publishing it. That was pu after publishing it. Uh, a tide of um, actors and Hollywood stories and soccer players and all that um, invaded the media. And, and this is interesting. I mean, it's, it's important because it talks about how, how we needed to find new ways to deliver a message through different ways that are not always necessarily related to the traditional media. So that's, that's one of the reasons we're talking about this. So the point is, okay. uh, we were encouraged by the uh, relative success of, of the story um, and also it triggered some interest in us. Oh, so there are more European borders and they go very far actually. Why not explore these borders? What's happening in the, in, the, in the other borders that we don't know? The first thing I discovered is that there were many parts of Europe I didn't know at all. I am not ashamed or I am ashamed to confess that I had no idea what Kaliningrad was, for example. Uh, my knowledge of the Balkans was not very deep. Although I had been hearing about the Balkan Wars for 10 years, I didn't have a clear idea where a country started and where, where the other uh, ended. Um, the knowledge of our geography is very poor. I mean, the European geography. And I, and I, I saw it in myself, uh, a seasoned photographer still with very black holes in my knowledge of European geography, and that is um, that strikes me a lot. Well, I, I can say that even when we publish a second story in this same map, uh, I mean, Romania and uh, Bulgaria were confused. So imagine, the, the, I mean, we don't know much about Europe. <laughs> I, I wasn't the one that, that did the, the map, but the one that did the map, <laughs> it didn't even look at the Google Maps. So, of course, what we, what we saw is that um, although migration was still uh, a topic in many places, there was another thing that we don't think about very often in Spain, which is Russia. Russia is not a big topic in Spain because it's far away. We don't think they're going to invade us. But Baltic countries, they think they're going to be invaded by the Russians every day. They really believe so, and they have reasons to believe it. Um, mm, the relationship between the Baltic countries and Poland and NATO is a lot tighter than we thought. Um, 
Mm -hmm. While a large part of the population in Spain is traditionally against NATO because we feel we don't like to have American stations in our soil, Polish and Baltics are super happy to have NATO there. They would like to have more. And, and, and Romania is the same. And uh, These are things we didn't have a clear idea about this. And we had the feeling that many people didn't know about these things. So we tried to connect all these things. Right? And then the big mystery of Finland. Finland has this 1,300 kilometers borders with Russia. What's, what's, what's the matter there? What's going on there? Are they okay? We know it's a big country with a small population, with a very particular geography. Uh, so we had to travel to these places. Again, talking about journalism, we had to ask for a grant and take some private money to do this thing, because we need to encourage our magazine to send us back on the track, and to do that, some money was welcome. So that's how journalists need to work today. You need to raise money to make stories. And we were asked to photograph in color this time, because Odin wants color. I don't know, that's what they say at least. <laughs> I, I like black and white uh, photography, not always, but I like it and I also feel it's useful because it makes uh, a big story more compact and more um, um, consistent, particularly when pictures have, have been taken in different parts, but then they ask us to photograph in color. So, this picture you see in here, this is in the Balkans, 215, uh, 20, uh, 2015. 2015. That took us by surprise, just as anyone else, I suppose, here in Europe. Suddenly, from one day to another, people start coming from Turkey, they cross Greece, cross the Balkans, and suddenly the story becomes finally a European topic, very quickly. And we are there, we, we rush to the place, and we experience what's going on there. That, that was something unexpected. Uh, but in fact, it, it, it kind of boosted the whole story and, and it showed some of the first cracks, also because some very sad episodes happened during this summer. Even here in Austria there was this incredibly sad story of uh, dead migrants inside the track. you remember that thing? It's already forgotten, but it was a big thing. And, you know, this is how we forget things. Yeah, the, the, the surprising thing about, well, first of all, um, we were not supposed to do this story. I mean, it was a story about the eastern border related to Russia, etc. Um, but then this happened, and Carlos rushed uh, over there. I met him two or three days later, and uh, so what was going on the, the day I, 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 I landed? This is uh, the border between Serbia and uh, Croatia. Uh, Europe was closing the internal borders. So that was going on uh, at the same time the people were crossing. So, and I remember we were talking over there, uh, like, um, so uh, the collapse of, of Europe doesn't happen from one day to another. It's not the kind of things that you read. It's the kind of things that you read in, in history books, but it's not the way it happens in, in, in daily life. Uh, how it goes is uh, a little crack, then another crack, and then another crack. So th you have these people trying to get into Europe and the countries saying, okay, we can say goodbye to this policy of Schengen of having open borders. Uh, so, I mean, that was the context at that moment. So that's how our mind was evolving at that time. And also we experience uh, things at the um, Serbian-Hungarian border that were um, an, an appetizer of what is happening today. This uh, mayor we encountered he would say, you know, this mayor of a small village in the border between Hungary and, uh, and uh, Serbia, uh, extreme right-wing uh, politician, we interviewed this guy and he said, look, these people, their dreams are destroying our dreams. We need to defend us from there. And another thing I would tell you is that we already kicked away the Muslims hundreds of years ago and we don't want them back. We are a Christian country and we don't want them back. That's this symbol. That was the first time we, we heard this kind of um, 
statement so openly and so clearly, openly to a journalist, you know, a politician openly saying, look, this is the situation, we don't want the Muslims back. That's very simple. Um, you know, these kind of things have been evolving and today that's a, almost an everyday topic. This is something we talk about every day and this is opening uh, questions. What about, what's the European identity? Is Europe going to survive? Is it related to uh, human rights? Is it related to Christian identity? All these things are, you know, in our everyday conversations. Anyway, let's keep going. Just to, to say one more thing, between yeah. that picture and this picture, yeah. so this is in uh, Balkans. That, that summer in the Balkans, September 2015, and this, this uh, new picture, this is late November 2015. Uh, what happened in between, this is in, in Latvia, and what happened in between is uh, the terrorist attacks in Paris. Uh, and they are, somehow these two pictures are, are closely linked. Um, so the thing is, you have people entering Europe, but then this... Explain what it's... What okay, it's this picture. place, okay, this is uh, Latvia, uh, eight kilometers away from the Belarusian border, Please. and it's United States soldiers uh, during a, an exercise, a drill, a NATO drill. So they are playing a war game uh, in which a country which is not Russia, but it's na named Redland, and it, its geography, its Russia, uh, is invading uh, the Baltic countries. So they are defending it. And the thing is, uh, I wanted to, to um, tell you about these terrorist attacks that somehow the people started to link to uh, uh, the refugees coming. So that link between Muslim refugees and terror attacks uh, was also new for Europe and made the policies evolve. Well, this is uh, the other thing. That's the, the the Russian thing you were talking about. Yeah, that's that's something that we also discovered. Not many people were aware that more than two thousand American troops were eight kilometers away from Belarus, shooting uh, with tanks. I don't know about you, but I had no idea. Uh, uh, the British were there, uh, Canadians, snipers. Uh, um, practicing and, and testing their weapons in so close to the uh, to the Russian border. And this is, you know, NATO and Russia are tickling each other so closely in the Baltic countries that you would say, who is looking for troubles actually? Or who, who should go away from there? It's not so clear. And what is the position of the European Union there? So this is opening another question that today is an open question um, does the European Union need an army, a European army? You know, the European Union was based on the idea that we will not use armies anymore, but we relied on on the United States because the United States is 80 percent of NATO. So we, but then suddenly Trump was elected and uh, he said NATO is obsolete. Oh, by the way, European Union is obsolete too. Uh, you know, all these things happen in two years. Anyway, but by the way, I forgot yeah. to say that you flew from Paris to this place. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, uh, you were you you were in Paris yeah. during the days of the terrorist attacks. And those days, when we were talking about the terrorist attacks, um, was the first time that we were beginning to use the word the crack to refer to about the to talk about these different things um, getting inside the heart of Europe and separating each other and the nationalism is growing and the fascism is growing in Europe and the populism is growing in Europe um, and those things were close re closely related, really closely related to what we were seeing in the border in this place. So when we arrived to Finland we were expecting a country very worried about uh, you know, this large border with this threatening neighbor, which is Russia. But then we discovered at that time their main um, um, concern was very different from what we had expected. Uh, 35,000 refugees had arrived in Finland in very few months and they were freaking out. 
because you know there's it's only five million people country so 35,000 people are difficult to handle and particularly you know in Scandinavia they're not very used to people coming from other places because historically it has been so isolated because of its geography they're not used to that of course Spain has been invaded by anyone just like Italy and Greece and you know in southern countries we have been also here you've been invaded by anyone but not in the uh, uh, in Scandinavian countries that idea of you know brown people coming that was completely new to them so in one hand they were very welcoming because of course it's the best welfare uh, uh, state of the world but at the same time they would they, they were experiencing some cultural clashes they didn't expect particularly in terms of uh, gender equality that was a big uh, challenge to them yeah we, what happened just before we were over there uh, was the New Year's Eve uh, strange thing that happened in Cologne Cologne? 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 Yeah. Cologne? Yeah. It's pronounced correctly so they were freaking out with that too so they were having these lessons for refugees about gender uh, equality etc uh, with the only refugee that was like came years ago and uh, had some knowledge about uh, Finland and how things work in Europe, in Finland, because they were, I mean, they had really no uh, migration before, like really low, and they were, everything was new for them. Yeah, and, and, and we, we, so we discovered very basic things last, so there were 35,000 refugees, I don't know which percentage, but say 50% were men, maybe, so some thousand men between 20 and 40 years old ready to work, ready to shovel snow in deep winter in Finland, but unable to work because of you know, legal reasons. They're not insured, so they cannot work, so they cannot help in any way. So essentially they spend their time in a shelter where they get bored very quickly, so of course tensions arise. and. You know, all these inconsistencies between rights and, and needs arise very quickly in these kind of situations. You have people that would be useful for working and that would be happy to work, but in fact they can't. And, and also they can't because we don't want them to work, because if they work then they acquire some rights. And if they acquire rights, we cannot send them back. So, you know, all these things what was interesting about, about these refugees arriving to Finland is not the case of these guys, um, but it was that they had uh, entered Europe through the Balkans where we were, and at the same time, more or less, that we were there in September, and it was January, and they were arriving after crossing uh, different borders of Europe. Um, so they traveled to Croatia, Austria, Germany, etc., and went all the way around uh, um, into Finland. So. And the, the, the Finnish people were asking, I mean, why? And how do they come over here? Because they, of course, they know where to go. Uh, they know that in Germany they are loaded with, uh, with uh, people over there and that if they go to Finland, they will have a shelter. So, but this situation is really different. But we will not spoil it. We, we will, will show the image, but we will not say anything. But this is the, <laughs> one of the, the north, further north uh, borders. Yeah, this is Arctic Europe. Circle. Arctic Circle in winter, yeah. in January. You want to know the story? See the book. <laughs> anyway, again it was uh, published uh, in El País and so on, traditional um, publishing. We did videos again, talking about the great exodus, the invisible enemy, which was Russia. Because in fact, we were, everyone was talking about Russia, but you could never see Russians anywhere. Except for Ukraine, of course, uh, we, had, we had been a little bit into Ukraine because then we had another surprise. When we were in Lithuania, this um, Canadian officer openly says, oh, you know, we Canadians, we are inside Ukraine. We are training the Ukrainians against the Russians. Uh, so you should go there. In fact, they invited us to see, to see what they were doing. And we discovered there are British, Americans, and Canadians inside Ukraine openly training Ukrainians against Russians. Um, 
So does the general audience know that? I, I don't. I didn't know, and I don't think many people know that. But but they don't. They are not even trying to hide it. They were very open about it. That surprised me also. Surprised us. Mm -hmm. And there were no journalists there. But why there were not journalists? <laughs> Okay, the, th the thing is they were very sad because they had lots of uh, journalists that were willing to go over there. Uh, that was 2015, but then one thing happened, is Russia became a major player in, in the Syrian war. So the Syrian war now became a huge war um, with many countries, I think it's around 80 countries involved. Um, for the first time Russia, Russia got over there and all the journalists conflict journalists went to Syria and forgot about Ukraine. So they were very happy to have us over there and they showed everything to us. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We're the only free... free Suddenly we are the only journalists in, in a way, in a place where, you know, it was interesting, but no one's there. So, um, okay, by at this point, or at some point of all this um, um, adventure, so to call, uh, of course, we, we realized we had to make a book about this because, you know, uh, just publishing 20 pages here, 20 pages there, uh, that doesn't explain the whole thing. And we were, we kind of thought we need to explain this panoramic view of the current situation of the European Union through the vehicle of the, of the borders, through, through this uh, Story. So let's make a book about the borders of Europe. First of all, let's remember there are borders in Europe. Europe starts somewhere and ends somewhere. And there is uh, a border with military, uh, with heavy presence of military and, and police. So let's talk about and let's make a book and let's, let's spread the word and let's talk about Europe. Europe is being challenged, is not given for granted. There are many voices saying we should we, sh we should be better off without the European Union. Why, why are we keeping this euro currency that is inflicting so much financial pain in many countries like ours? Um, so um, we decided to make a book, and in the beginning, the idea was to make you know a traditional uh, book with a selection of the, some of the best pictures that I was able to 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 take during during all this trip. And maybe Guillermo would write a foreword, and maybe we would have some uh, Euro MP writing some, you know, some prologue, or maybe an expert. But then, in fact, I was thinking of writing my own written book. Yeah, and you were thinking about pictures. And yeah, we were thinking about of words. That, that's right. I was thinking about making a photo book, and he was thinking about making a novel or something like that. And then. Uh, and then thinking about how would people react to this? Is this book going to get anywhere? Is, this, is people going to buy this book? Are people ready to spend 40 euros to buy some 70 pictures of poor migrants in Bulgaria? Is this real thing? In fact, it's not happening, or so I thought. So we came up with the idea to make something different that may uh, Take, get the attention of people with this language that you, uh, you have already seen, which is the graphic novel. And we tested it, and, and, and it looked nice, and it looked okay, and it was good for explaining very different, very complex situations, and with many nuances and a lot of information, then suddenly uh, it was clear that it worked. So, you know, we made a script like this, no more than this, because in fact the script was our memories essentially. Uh, we just needed to write them down and and to remember. Fortunately, Guillermo is a you know is old-fashioned guy writing on paper. <laughs> and, uh, he doesn't have Facebook. Can you imagine? <laughs> and he's younger than me. <laughs> anyway, plenty of encrypted information in this book notes that no one can read except for him. Um, so we uh, work together. I'm, I'm going through this uh, process of making the book because I find it's, you know, it could be interesting for, for some reasons and then we can, you know, whenever you want to ask anything about either uh, the book making or the topic of Europe itself, you know, we start conversation as soon as you want. 
uh, we need to create the uh, maps. Uh, you remember I said I was astonished by my ignorance of European geography and then I thought the only way for people to follow the story of this book is to have a map very often uh, to, to, you know, and with very little information, just the essential information of countries and the places where they have been, not even the capitals of each place, you know, almost like a book for kids. Make things very easy. Use very plain colors and big type uh, typography that you can read easily. Um, and of course, um, this comic book language. So this is okay, and uh, technical aspect or, or artistic aspect that you may you know may be interested. I transform the photographs from a plain photograph to something that is still a photograph but looks a little bit like a kind of illustration, but without losing the uh, photography nature of the image because I think photography still has this power of transmitting that someone has been there and has taken the picture right in front of the action. And that is still a value. Of course, you, you can draw this, and there are, out there there is a table with other graphic novels with amazing drawings, and they are amazing graphic novels. But the power of photography, I think, is still value. Uh, but of course, if you use plain photography in this way, then you're making a photo novella, which, you know, how do you call this in English? Is this a, 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 a photo novel or a, a roman photo, or anything photo like roman. this? Photo roman. Which, you know, it's, um, I didn't like very much. I don't think it's very popular today. I know it was popular in the 70s and 80s, particularly in Italy. And it has been popular in Latin America for a bit longer, but certainly not today, not in Europe not popular and it's always related to romance and to soft porn and stuff like that and so I needed to get out of there and get, get, get the uh, audience to think of a graphic novel and not uh, of uh, this kind of books. And so the way we built this, uh, we built this story in, in right in the opposite way that a normal graphic novel is built. Usually you have a script, so the, the writer will, will, will write a story, and then the drawing man will, will uh, illustrate the, uh, the words. But we, our story was based on photographs, so the, the number of photographs was limited. It was a big number of photographs, about 25,000 images, so almost unlimited. Well, yeah, you know, <laughs> you know, the difference between a number and unlimited is universal. So <laughs> anyway, um, so I had to essentially I had to build um, a visual narrative of things of of the events, and then suggest more or less how much text it could go with images. And once I was able to produce pages that looked good, that were attractive from a visual point of view and instinctively uh, narrative, then it was Guillermo's time to, you know, to give life to these images, to include words and, and not just describing, but uh, including a lot of information he had in, in his notebooks and, and sentences that people actually said. And all this is giving life to, to the storytelling. And that's the big difference between a traditional photo book. A traditional photo book is often not much uh, self-speaking. It's, you know, you watch the images, you see the images, but you don't get the story right away. But with this way, you would get the story. And that was Guillermo's job. That went. So how was your experience doing this? So what I'd like to say is that the hardest thing was not putting word after word. Yeah. The hardest the thing weather. was um, to build a narrative, to say, so where are we departing from and where are we going to? So the hardest uh, moment was choosing the tense, no? the, the present tense. So we told the story as a diary. And why as a diary? Um, I've always been fascinated by the, the, the novels uh, or stories that are a trip. Uh, 
So it's a, El Quixote, the Quixote is a, it's a, a trip where the authors, I mean the, the, the protagonist goes and goes back and his life has changed. Um, it's also the Odyssey, it's a, a, this kind of trip and also Little Red Riding Hood, it's a, it's a kind of trip. Um, so I wanted to tell our own experience, how, I mean we began this story when Europe was different and when we were different, we didn't know anything about many of the things we were going to, to understand afterwards. Um, so that's the, the kind of trip we wanted to tell, uh, from the beginning to the end, how Europe had changed. Europe is the real protagonist and that's, the way, that's why we opened with uh, the European Union and explaining the European Union because it's the, the real subject of our story, but also how we changed, how it, it, things affected to us and how we were seeing things evolving in, in Europe. And why this kind of narrative? Because today the news, um, it's, uh, I mean, it's just seconds. I mean, in our newspaper, uh, the average reader spends, uh, I think it's 40 seconds on our website. That's the average reader, 40 seconds. Um, that means it's one, one story after one story after one story, and in the end you say, I mean, what, so what happened one year ago, or two years ago, or three years ago? And that's the kind of thing that we wanted to tell. So the broad picture, the whole story, starting in Africa and ending in the Arctic Circle, and it's the whole story of Europe and related to the borders, to migration, to Russia, and to its own uh, ghosts. Uh, old ghost like uh, nationalism yeah yeah so yeah <laughs> i mean it, the information we get from the news is so fragmented that he say 40 seconds in the average for uh el país which is still number one uh newspaper in spanish and so that's the average 40 seconds oh, we've got 14 14 million no, how, how much five, five million every day so five which million per bad. 40 seconds that's a lot but it's yeah. i mean <laughs> I'm talking about the way we get informed. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, but the reality is that the reader. I mean, it, it happens to me too. I don't, I don't read long stories online, and the reality is also that I don't, I don't have much time to read a long book explaining me what's happening in, in Europe. So we figure that if we're able to make a story that you can read in one hour and a half, and with this you get the sense that you've learned something, and also it is. Uh, easy to read because it's a kind of adventure. You're learning something, but at the same time you are, you know, entertained. Uh, then we might be able to transmit the message, which is the ultimate goal in the end. So this is us uh, working, and this is how half of the book looks together. This is half of the book. Uh, it's very nice to see it this way. You don't, you usually don't see books this way, but you know, it's nice. Um, so this is how it looks today, exactly. These are pictures of a book itself. And there you go. The book ended up in mainstream bookshops together with Batman and other graphic <laughs> novels. <laughs> Which is, from our point of view, a big success. Because if you're able to put this kind of story there, then you might have a chance to transmit this kind of story to a general audience that usually don't pay attention to these things. But then suddenly we, we think we found a way to do it. And this is the last image, but probably not the last word. So we are now ready for uh, conversation. So thank you very much for the presentation. I think it was very, very informative and very interesting also for me. And thank you also very much for answering most of the questions I put there today and yesterday when I was reading the book. And so you make it easy for me. Whatever I, I would like, maybe just to just some points which I think is very important, which struck me a lot when I was reading the book. Like the first is, I'm very happy that you also you you went to Melia and all of you you saw the fence there. I mean, it's uh, everyone knows like how we all got super super um, annoyed about what Trump is that about the wall in, in, in the U.S. and the Mexican people let the Mexican pay for it. And we not, we totally tend to forget that there are many many fences within Europe. It's not only in Melia in Northern Africa, which is at least located um, geographically in Northern Africa. Now we have them actually also in Austria. We have them um, in Slovenia. 
Uh, we have them in Hungary, we have them in Greece, in Bulgaria, in Macedonia. So actually, there's a lot of fences within Europe on, and within the European Union. Macedonia is not within the European Union, but still. So I think it's, we should actually consider this and think a little bit more about it. And the other thing I like a lot is that you, you travel first to the southern border, which is the main topic, uh, migrants and migration and refugees, since 2014. It is, at least for Austria, for maybe Italy, like middle, middle Europe, it was that topic. It was the hot topic. Everyone was talking. It was actually already quite of uh, the Africans told me, why are you Europeans so obsessed with migration? It, al it always happened, but it's just you're so obsessed with it. Uh, just besides, uh, just so uh, most of you might know, but um, migrants, most of the migrants and refugees are not within the European Union, but they're in Turkey, in Lebanon, in South Sudan, and in all the other countries. But still, the topic was only here for Middle Europe. And when you go then to, to the um, eastern part and to the northern part, you see there's a different historical context. It's not really so much about the migrants, but it's about also history. It's about the Russian aggression. It's about the UDSSR and whatever happened already earlier on. And I think this is. Uh, also very interesting that you gave us a little bit a uh, bigger picture of it. Um, what I also wanted just to mention shortly is in your book you described that you have been on this, um, I noted it down, a, fri a frigate called Grecale. Yeah, that's yeah. The, Italian the, Italian, the Italian Navy ship of the Mare Nostrum, um, where 218 people have been rescued. And what you also mentioned, which I think is very, very interesting, is that the handling of the situation, the treatment of the people was actually rather correct and uh, maybe a little bit graphy, but it was, uh, it was still respectful. And this is also true, I think, for many thousands of uh, people who have been and still are voluntarily supporting refugees and migrants in the respective European countries. And the other question is, like maybe just your opinion, um, do you think that also these stories are not really told told enough or maybe that um, these are parts of the glue which can repair the cracks uh, in Europe. Excuse me, say that again? Uh, the, like the people who are actually, who are helping, who are supporting, mm -hmm. like oh. maybe, you know, like all this volu voluntarism, like, you know, like the nice side of the story. But, the, okay, uh, recently, well, not so recently, but in September, we have been again on a on a military ship in the Mediterranean for four days, Spanish ship, in the uh, Operation Sofia, which is a new operation that somehow replaced Mare Nostrum and where more uh, European countries are involved. In fact, there were, there were Austrian uh, officers in that boat too, um, involved. That would. And um, we saw and we witnessed and we photographed and we reported the relationship between armies and NGOs. In fact, they do interact a lot and they do cooperate a lot. They usually don't say so. Uh, particularly NGOs often don't like to say they, they, they um, work together coordinated with armies, but in fact they do because they have to. Um, and and it also it's a more efficient way to, to to proceed because often NGOs have small ships and they bring people on board and then they put them in a bigger ship that belongs to some army or some you know, some uh, country army. Um, that is, I don't know if it's a bright side of the story. I don't think there is anything bright bright in this, but. Is it a glue? It's, it's funny because there is a glue in there between two sides of the society, NGOs and armies, but for some reason it's, it, they don't mention it very often. Not even, not even the army mentioned that very often. I mean, nobody talks about this. I don't know why. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay, so maybe um, the floor is up to you. So if you have a question or a comment or if you want to ask them, they are here, uh, please just raise your hand and feel free to ask whatever you like. Take the opportunity, please. Yeah, this is about Europe. Um, have you seen or heard in any of the countries uh, that people speak of a European perspective rather than a narrow national interest guided perspective vis a vis the refugee crisis? Mm. I'll say it's just the opposite. Um, I, I normally ask this kind of questions to the people. Uh, so, you, do you feel European? I remember asking that, that question 
in, in I mean, was the Balkans, uh, but Europe. And they said, I, I feel Balkan, Balkanic. Uh, I remember asking that question in Finland too, and they said, well, I, I feel like Scandinavian. So they don't have, in those places in the borders, they don't, I, I'll say they don't have this European feeling, like a, this super structure. We're not that close together as we would like to. Um, what I'd say too is that the migrant's perspective is of a total. That's the different side. Um, so they say, yeah, I want to go to Europe. They don't say, I do. I want to go to Germany. Okay, maybe they'll go to Germany. But they'll say, I want to go to Europe. And they feel Europe mostly as a country. At least that's my, my experience. Of course, we also found lots of people that believe in the European Union. And they think that it's a very good, especially the young people, they think it, it's a very, I don't know, something they were born with and they like it. But I say, I mean, we were traveling in those days when, um, and I remember one story, um, it's the Greek perspective of, of it all. So um, you had this moment when almost a million refugees entered Europe through Greece uh, and through Turkey. Uh, so we're, I mean, we had been there before and we saw like a great barrier. The Greek people didn't let anyone in. So we were asking, so what happened in between? And what happened in between was the negotiation of the rescue, or the third rescue of, of, of Greece. Um, the financial bailout. The financial bailout, sorry, the rescue. Uh, yeah. um, so we found these words of the defense minister, which was from the uh, nationalist side, so it was Tsipras and the nationalists, um, saying, so, okay, if you want to, um, you want to, uh, how, how you say, if you want to um, asphyxiate uh, us, uh, we will send you millions of refugees. And it will, we, it will be worse for you, Germany, uh, because there will be some uh, terrorists in those refugees. So, I mean, uh, we didn't see much of a European feeling in those days. No, that, that, that was, in fact, a, a very big crack that had been boiling for some years on. You know, the, uh, during the financial crisis, Greece and Germany had been seriously antagonist. Also, the Greeks, Greeks never, never forgot Second World War. There's, it's still here. And suddenly Germans come back and, and they put pressure on Greece and, and then Tsipras wins in Greece, and they go to Brussels and to Berlin, try to negotiate this bailout, and they kicked away. Mr. Varoufakis is kicked home, essentially, and then Greeks' national pride is so much hurt, and the only way they find to somehow put pressure on the European Union is to allow people to go to Berlin, and that is a, that is a key moment in European history, because that is using human beings as a, a tool, as a weapon for pressure. The only weapon Greek, Greece could use at that moment. And that is a big crack, you know, when, when two countries are acting this way, each other. Yeah, so no, normally when you read the newspaper, you, you get the finance part in one side of the newspaper, and you get the refugees in the other side of the paper, and whatever or the social aspects in another piece of the paper. So what we wanted is to, to get all those things together because they are tied. Um, they are, I mean, all, all linked together. All the cracks are somehow um, uh, pushing each other to the extremes. Um, and that's and the only way to, to, to tell it is, like, over here, is it related to Putin? We, I remember myself, is it related to Russia policy, Russian policy, what we are seeing today? And in fact, it was related because Putin was interested in uh, fighting in Syria, uh, getting people in, into Europe, etc. I mean, everything in, in the end is somehow connected. Anyone else? Yes, please. I personally think it's a very helpful thing to have your novel there and to see what you witnessed, actually. So my question is, were there any events or places where you were not allowed to take photographs? Hmm. Well, there were several <laughs> places where we could not take photographs. Uh, most of the time we, re we respected it 
for strategic reasons. I mean, you need to you need to do whatever you can, and we rely a lot on permissions. Uh, but when you are working, as we did in different situations, with military and police, you need to follow the rules because if one day you don't, you will be blacklisted. And a blacklist in NATO means blacklisted everywhere. So you need to follow the rules. Um, sometimes we didn't follow the rules, we have to say, but for very, very light situations. I mean, we didn't uh, went to any really... Uh, sensitive place, but we, yeah, we, we had many limitations. Essentially, we, we were very looked after. They were asking not to photograph this, not to photograph that, but that's part of the job. And, and in the book, it's explained also that that is how we get the information. In fact, again, um, we were on, on this Italian ship during a rescue operation, and the reason we were there is is because the Italians decided it was about time that people saw that what they were doing. And why was it? Because they were paying all these Mare Nostrum operation by themselves. Very expensive operation. And no one in Europe was giving a euro for that. It was all paid by Italians. And they were complaining all the time. Where are the Germans? Where are the French? Where is everybody? We need more ships, we need more money, we need more people. Nobody's paying attention. Okay, we will bring in the journalists, we will show what's, what we're doing, and we will make Europe wake up about this topic. So, again, money is connected to what we see and why we see it. There, is, there are reasons why we see things in the moment we see it. I, I say it, it became an obsession, obsession uh, for us um, to see the real things, because... Uh, there, there were no, no limitations in order to take a picture of this fence or whatever. Sometimes there were, but there were limitations in to what we could uh, see. For example, we wanted to uh, spend the night with the Spanish police force in the border, and, and they, they wouldn't let us. Um, they say, we, we can give you some pictures, or they, they say, you can go, come with us, but not during our normal duty. Uh, so it became an, an obsession to go uh, into a real uh, thing. That's part of the, what guides the book. Is we want to get to see the real thing. Uh, and we find, when we get into the boat, it's what we say. We want to see uh, what you are doing, exactly what you're doing, without, um, without any, any barriers. And in the end, we, we had it. You see, very often they will offer you their images. They will say, oh guys, don't worry, we will send you a CD with plenty of pictures of whatever you want to see. We have plenty, we have photographers, we will provide you with images. Of course, me as a photographer, you can imagine my face. <laughs> like, yeah, so you want to, you know, shall I go home then? And then, uh, um, so we need to insist that, look, we have a policy of direct witnessing that we cannot breach and but yeah that's a big part of the of the job you know negotiating what what you can see and what you cannot see and for what reason <laughs> what, what is so strange is that words are allowed to go free um, it's always the obsession with uh, the pictures that's the great obsession uh, and I'm saying this because I recently read a book that is the the trip uh, with, um, Steinbeck, John Steinbeck, the writer, and uh, Robert Kappa, the photographer, uh, did together as a journalist, a writer, and a photographer to the USSR in the, it was 1948. And it was the same. So John Steinbeck, what, what he writes down is the uh, awkward obsession of the Russians in, in prohibiting and saying no to most of the pictures. Mm -hmm. But there wasn't any complaint about the words. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's a nightmare because you know they are obsessed with the with the uh, with the impact of an image, and they never pay attention that a writer may invent anything, and nobody <laughs> pays attention to that. <laughs> yeah. Fake news. Anyway, yeah. fake news. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> More questions or comments? Yes, please. Um, first of all, um, I think you did a really good job uh, building this narrative. And, but um, as you were talking about it, I thought, oh my God, you have to be geniuses. 
because um, you didn't uh, say anything about it was your first time, you had to counsel, have to take some counseling or reading comic theory or uh, looking at that uh, on a lot of other uh, graphic novels. How did you do it? Oh yeah, yeah, that's, that, that's, a, that's a good question. In fact, uh, my first reaction was to, I went to Amazon and, you know, typed how to make a graphic novel. And I found make a graphic novel for dummies and I bought it. I bought it. It was very bad and I wasn't satisfied so I had to keep uh, digging and seeing uh, other the uh, theory of comics and I found one which is an essential reading for anyone making comics or graphic novels. It's called Understanding Comics by Scott McCloud. It's, uh, it's, it's a milestone in theory of uh, uh, visual storytelling in paper, in, in printed. Uh, besides that, I had been reading um, graphic novels by other authors. Uh, some of them are out, out there in the table. There is one experiment with uh, photographs that was made in the, uh, about 10 years ago or more, maybe 12, I think. It's called The Photographer. It's a story of a photographer that goes to Afghanistan in the in the 80s, I think, yeah, uh, with a no in the 90s with a with a MSF team, and he spends I don't know how many months in Afghanistan, and when he goes back to Europe, some years later he makes this graphic novel together with a drawer and a writer, and they put together this experiment mixing drawings, photographs, and of course text. Um, that this is one of the few, or I would even say the, the only experimenting with uh, photographs and graphic novels that I know about. I know other stories, but really of not uh, of a very bad quality or too small or not so ambitious. But this, was, this, this book is really, really good. Um, anyway, I had to experiment a lot and learn a lot. So graphic novel for dummies. And then finally, uh, a, a theory of how to make graphic novels. Of course, I had to, yeah. It wasn't my case. Um, <laughs> I didn't read anything. I, what, what, I, what I didn't know is how much I had read comic books since I was a kid. And lately, uh, some, some, it was this Christmas, I was talking to my, my mother about comic books, and she told me that there was, uh, when I was 12, 13, um, my parents talked about me and they were worried because I didn't read books. But my mother said, but it's okay, he's reading comic books. So I was uh, reading a lot of comic books since I was a kid. I, I even found uh, that I had done a, like, a comic strip uh, in those, those days. Um, but no, I didn't go for the, for the Amazon thing and I didn't, no. But he was, I mean, he was building the, the big thing. So that was for him. Yeah, well, I have to say I had a, a kind of vision one day, uh, it's like I saw it in my mind and I, it was like 2 a.m. and I went to my laptop and made a page and I saw it and, and I couldn't sleep because I had the feeling I had created something and yeah, it was impressive for me to, to get to this point and then and it, wasn't, it was, you know, great just to build this story. It was. It's a it's a it's a pleasure to create something. It's a real pleasure. So, yeah. Yes, please. Have you had any oh. situation where um, when uh, the persons, the immigrants you were photographing, they felt offended, or what was the general reaction when you were taking a photo of them? Um, so usually, um, so often they ignore you. Other times they cooperate with you, meaning they talk to you, they tell you their stories, they want to know about what you're doing and why. This happens sometimes, not very often. And whenever someone expresses any reluctance or, you know, ask me not to take pictures, I don't. It doesn't matter, there is so many other things to do. That, I mean, if you have, you know, 5,000 people and there two or three say, I don't want to be photographed, that's not a big deal, no problem. Most of the time, um, you know, they, I think they take it as part of the, uh, ex their, I would say, I was about to say experience, but I mean, part of their trip, part of their 
struggle. They are coming to Europe, they are walking the fields, so they are crossing the land. And so they know sooner or later they're going to meet these journalists. They know they're going to be in the news. And it's a right for them. They have other more important things to, to think about in that moment. But sometimes someone said, I don't want to be photographed, and that's not a big deal. You've, you've got a, a strategy, um, a very good <laughs> strategy of, of coping with the situation. That is, uh, and I remember one particular moment that you can see in the graphic novel. There's a picture where you can see um, two uh, migrants posing for the picture, and other two doing like this. It's not showing their faces. And the reason is, um, so they were, I was talking to them. So Carlos said, "Can I take a picture? Is it okay?" And the ones on the right side said, "No, we don't want to to be on the picture." So he said, and this is the strategy, so can you please help me and, and move a little bit so I can take the picture? So they feel like, mm, no, I don't want to, I want to be in the picture. So they, they just did like this and they appear in the picture. No, that, that, if any of you is a photographer and you've experienced that, that's something you need to try. Whenever someone says, I don't want to be photographed, say, all right, move away. I want to photograph anyone except you. And then suddenly they go, oh, wait, wait a minute. I want to be in the picture. <laughs> There was also another question, please. Yeah, yeah, I had a question because I saw like your book was done with Superman and all the other novels. So I was asking myself if you ever experienced it, like a bookseller was telling you that people who were reading the book or seeing it, that they were not, that they were thinking it's not real picture. So that you had once this moment that people were thinking, oh, is that real? That, that is a very... It's the real as well. That is a very good point, and I think it, it, it serves very well the, 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 the purpose of the book. I mean, when you see it, you ask yourself whether this is real or not. For a second or for some time, you may doubt. You may, what is this? Is this possible? Is all this actually happening? Is this real? And then, of course, you have lots of information that tell you that the thing is real. So I think the impact is deeper. Because first you don't believe it's real, and then when you realize it's actual things happening, then I think there is a deeper impact because of that. But was somebody, somebody any time asking you this, like just seeing it for the first time, but not really reading it, not really mm, into it? Not to me. It did happen. It did happen to me. Okay. Uh, to one one colleague in the newspaper, whom I was showing the book for the first time, they didn't know anything. Um, and when I said, ah, oh, because uh, the photographer. And so I said, what photographer? So, so they didn't realize on the first look, I mean, it was a first glance. Whenever you start reading it with, with interest, you notice that what's going on. Um, but for the first glance, it was like, it was very well drawn. Mm -hmm. But that's a really interesting point because it's also journalists who saw it and he was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> OK, anyone else? Okay, no. So I think we can maybe close here. I'm going to make a last advertisement uh, for the book. This is it. I, I actually did read it and I, um, I don't want to say enjoy because it's, you know, the topic is quite tough and it's not really to enjoy, but it's, it's, uh, it's important storytelling, I would say. And it's uh, also artistic and it's impressively done. And I think it is important to to use all the tools we have to make um, important topics, to um, just make it to a wide, accessible to a wide public. I have, I have been presenting this book in, in several uh, schools mm -hmm. to an audience of people uh, about 16 years old, and they, they seem to appreciate, they seem to like it, so I'm very happy about this. Yeah. So um, you can also purchase it outside if you would like to. Nobody's forced uh, to, of course. And maybe they will also write you something in it, a dedication if you ask them. So um, it is an opportunity. Um, then we will invite you to a glass of wine, which uh, my colleague is already bringing. He's fast. Thank you, Malte. Great. <laughs> and uh, I wish you, you, you're going to be here for some more minutes. So yeah, you yeah, can yeah. just approach them, ask them, get some, ex get some of their experience, get to know them. And thank you very much for coming. It was a very nice. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you for inviting us. Yeah, that was great. You. It was a pleasure. Thank, thank you very much.